Welcome to the Nat Theo Podcast, where we explore nature, the Bible, and what both of them show us about our Creator God, who made this wild and wonderful world. I'm your host, Erin Lynham. I'm a certified master naturalist, Bible teacher, and author, and I am so excited to explore God's Word and His created world with you. We hope that you have been enjoying the Nat Theo podcast. And we are so excited to invite you to something super fun this school year, the Nat Theo Club. We want to send you a full color digital activity guide to go along with every Nat Theo podcast episode so you can learn more about God's wild and wonderful world. These guides will include pictures to go along with the lesson and all the scriptures and definitions that we talk about, along with discussion questions and activities to help you dig in deeper to the day's lesson. It will also include a full color poster that you can print out, collect, and hang on your wall. The Nat Theo Club is a Patreon membership. This means that you can support our show and future episodes while receiving more resources and content. Did you guys know that each episode, from research, to writing, to recording and editing, takes around 12 hours? We love doing this, and the show is growing to the point where we're going to need to bring on some help. If you'd like to support the show and join the Nat Theo Club, you can learn more and join at the link in today's show notes or at erinlinum.com slash natheo. Have you ever collected anything? maybe seashells or rocks. My kids have a collection of fossils and prairie dog skulls and skeletons that they have found. Recently, my daughter and I were at a lake and she was collecting all sorts of things that she found in the woods and along the shore. And she had this plastic box that was separated into different sections. And into one section, she placed acorns. And into another, she put pine cones and then rocks in another section. When we collect things, we often separate or sort them by categories. Maybe you sort your rocks by size or color or the type of rock that it is. We tend to think this way a lot in categories. Maybe you've done this in a school book or an activity book where there are different images in a row and you're supposed to circle the things that belong together. Or maybe you're supposed to circle every animal that belongs on a farm or in an ocean. From a very young age, we learn to put things into categories. Today, we are going to learn about a very interesting category of living things. Here's our trail map. We're going to look at what are mushrooms. Are they aliens? We're going to look at what other living things are like mushrooms. We're going to see how fungus can help humans, plants, and our planet. And we'll look at how does fungus use code like a computer. But first, I have a trivia question for you. What is the largest living thing on Earth? Do you have any ideas? Think about what you think it might be, and we'll learn the answer at the end of today's episode. A few hundred years ago, there was a man named Carl Linnaeus. He was a scientist with a very big job to do. He was sort of like a master sorter. His job was to create a system for categorizing everything alive. Carl made two big categories, plants, and animals. And then he began sorting all of the plants into the plant category and all of the animals into the animal category. And of course, he didn't have a sorting box like my daughter did that day at the lake. That would have had to be a massive box. But instead, he was doing this all on paper, making lists and a naming system for everything alive. And so Carl would look at, say, a ponderosa pine tree and decide, okay, This is a plant. And then he would continue to categorize it and say, okay, it's a tree. Further, it's a coniferous tree that makes pine cones. 
and so on. And so in his plant and animal categories, he had even smaller categories for sorting things further. Think of it this way. If I was holding a small, shiny, black and orange insect in my hand, and you were watching it crawl all over my palm and up my arm, and I asked you, is this a plant or a creature? What would you say? You would probably be able to guess by how it looks and moves that it is a creature. Now you might not know its exact name, that it's a Colorado soldier beetle, but you could probably guess that it is an insect and maybe even that it is a beetle. This was Carl's job and he could usually tell pretty quickly whether something was a plant or an animal, except for mushrooms. Huh? You see, mushrooms puzzled Carl. Hmm. Just like they have for so many scientists for such a long time. When Carl came to mushrooms, he saw that they didn't exactly fit into the plant category, nor did they fit into the animal category. He decided that they seemed more like plants than animals, and so he put them under the plant category and called them cryptogamia. However, as science grew and our understanding of everything that God has created and our technologies to look at things closer, we discovered that mushrooms are not plants at all, and they're also not animals. So what are mushrooms? Some people have joked that if mushrooms are not plants and they're not animals, they must have come from outer space and maybe they're aliens. Some people think mushrooms must come from outer space because they have some pretty amazing powers. We'll learn more about those powers in a few minutes. But first, if mushrooms aren't aliens, what are they? It ends up they are another amazing creation of God's, completely separate and unique from plants and animals. Over 200 years after Carl created a system for sorting plants and animals, another scientist named Robert Whittaker created a new section for sorting living things, and it is called the fungi section. This is the section that mushrooms belong to. You see, mushrooms are not a plant or an animal. And Carl was actually a bit off when he placed them into the plant category because they are more closely related to animals than plants. But again, they are not either. Mushrooms are another one of God's incredible creations. And they aren't the only thing in the fungi category. So let's pretend we're collecting things in nature that belong in the fungi category. What might we place into that fungi box? Do you have any ideas? Let's look at three other living things in the fungi category. Into our fungi box, we would place those mushrooms along with mold. Have you ever reached for an orange in a fruit bowl only to realize that the bottom was white or blue and fuzzy? That is mold and it's actually alive. Another thing we would place into the fungi box is lichen. If you're out hiking and you find bright orange or green or yellow substance growing across rocks or trees, it's likely lichen. Lichen are so interesting because they're actually both fungi and algae, which is a plant. They represent a super cool symbiotic relationship, like a friendship in nature that is both algae and fungi. Another thing that we would place into the fungi category is yeast. Yeast is what makes bread rise up and get puffy, and it is alive and part of the fungi category. Now that we know what goes into the fungi box, here's my son with a few fun, funny, fungi jokes to help you remember. Why did the mushroom always get invited to every party? Because he's a fungi. Knock, knock. Who's there? Mush. Mush who? Mush who always asks so many questions. I made a video about the relationship between algae and fungi. 
Don't forget to like and subscribe. How much room do fungi need to grow? As much as mushroom as possible. What did one fungi say to another fungi when they got married? I want to grow mold with you. Why does yeast always win the bread baking competition? Because it always rises to the occasion. <laughs> Let's look in our fungi box and focus back on the mushroom section. What I find so fascinating about mushrooms is that they are a fruiting body. What does this mean? Well, think about an apple hanging from an apple tree. We know that the apple is the fruit and it comes from this bigger plant, a tree. It's connected by the branches. Mushrooms are a lot like this. They are the fruit of a much bigger living thing called mycelium. You can think of mycelium kind of like a spider's web, but it's underground, it's often very big, and unlike a spider's web, the whole thing is alive. It is a fungal network and it produces fruit, which are mushrooms. So when we see a mushroom, we can remember that it is a part of something much bigger that we cannot see. And the same can be true with God's fruit in our lives. Wait, God makes fruit? Well, of course we know that he created all fruit when he made fruiting plants back at creation. But the Bible also talks about fruit in our lives. And it means the good things that come from our lives, the goodness that God produces in us. Galatians 5, 22 to 23 says the fruit of God's spirit that God produces in us are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you were a tree, you can think of these things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control, like the fruit hanging off your branches. This fruit points back to God and it blesses those around us. And of course, this fruit only comes from God. John 15, 5 tells us, I, that is Jesus, am the vine, and you are the branches. If any remain in me, and I remain in them, they produce much fruit. But without me, they can do nothing. Listeners, as we abide in Jesus, and that means as we rest in him, as we remain in him, as we read his word and spend time in prayer, he produces fruit in our lives. So when we see a mushroom, we can remember that it is the fruit of something much bigger that we cannot see. I love this about mushrooms. They are this little peek into the underground world of fungi. Mushrooms hint at something much bigger. And they can remind us that God gives us glimpses, these little hints into what he's up to in our lives. And we can trust that he's up to a whole lot more than what we can see. Do you remember why some people think mushrooms are from outer space? Because they're so unique and they have these really cool powers. God made the fungi category with some amazing abilities. Let's look at three ways that fungi is very powerful for the health of humans, plants, and our planet. Let's look at human health. Mushrooms and fungi have been used to help us humans stay healthy. One example was in World War II when a type of fungus led to a medicine called penicillin, which saved thousands of lives. Some mushrooms can be very good for helping keep our immune systems healthy, or giving us energy, or even helping with our memory. In many health food stores, you can find a whole area dedicated to mushroom supplements. You guys, every morning in my smoothie, I pour in mushroom powder, and I know that sounds kind of gross, but trust me, it actually tastes a lot more like chocolate than mushrooms. Another incredible job that God gave to fungi is to help trees. 
Do you remember the mycelial network that we talked about? That huge underground web of life that produces mushrooms? Well, that mycelial network helps trees share nutrients with one another. It's kind of like a web of tiny straws that the trees use to share nutrients and vitamins and healthy things that they need. So if one tree is sick or struggling, a nearby tree can send it nutrients through the mycelial network to help make it better and stronger and healthier. Another example of fungi helping plants is with orchid flowers. Have you ever seen a beautiful orchid flower? I have a video on my Instagram page of the wild orchids that I recently found while exploring the forest, and I'll link to that video in today's show notes. Well, orchids can't grow at all unless they're connected to a mycelial network that gives them energy. So we know that fungus can help humans and plants, and it can also help our planet. One thing that fungus is really good at is decomposing. What is decomposing? It means breaking things down. Have you ever seen an old log out in the woods that's kind of falling apart? That's the work of fungi. It breaks things down so they can become soil again and start a whole new cycle of growth. But fungi doesn't only break down logs. It can also powerfully break down unnatural things like plastic. So scientists are looking at how to use fungi to take care of problems like thrown out plastics on our planet. Fungi are God's natural recyclers. Now, because God created mushrooms and fungi to be very powerful, it's important that we also remember they can be very dangerous. The other day, my daughter and I were walking through the woods and we found a beautiful, big, bright orange mushroom. After looking it up, we found out that it is in the mushroom family called fly agaric. While some mushrooms in that family are safe, others can actually be deadly. You can see a video I took of this mushroom and a slug that was eating through it and burrowing into it on my Instagram page, and I'll share that link in today's show notes. It's important to remember that when you see a mushroom, observe it with your eyes and don't touch it. Unless you're with an experienced mycologist, that is someone who studies and knows mushrooms very well, do not touch mushrooms. So we know that fungi can be very good for human health and plant health and the health of our planet. We didn't even yet hit on the fact that some mushrooms can glow in the dark. That will have to wait for another episode on God's creations that glow in the dark. But I do want to share with you one more powerful thing that mushrooms can do. They can find their way through mazes. You see, fungi are very good at navigating or finding good paths to grow in. Let's look at a specific type of fungi called slime molds. That's a really fun name, right? These slime molds look like what their names sound like, slimy. It's kind of a big glob of fungi. Now, fungi moves pretty slowly. But scientists have performed many experiments watching the movements of slime mold, and they've discovered that it can navigate or find its way through mazes. Scientists have even used slime mold to research the most efficient or quickest evacuation routes for fire evacuations in buildings. They're also using slime mold to do things like urban planning and city planning to plan routes through towns and cities. Some scientists are even exploring ideas to use slime mold to program robots and solve math problems. Can you imagine if in math class, your teacher, instead of saying, hey, please grab your calculator, they said, grab your pencil, paper, and slime mold. There is a whole study in science where scientists look at how living things compute or use information like a computer. This study is called biocomputing, 
Bio, like biology, refers to life and living things. Biocomputing, living things that kind of act like computers. So if you like science and you like computers, this might be the field of study for you. But how does slime mold know how to find its way or solve problems when it doesn't have a brain? God gave humans and animals brains so that we can take in information and decide what to do with that information. But mushrooms don't have brains. It seems like slime molds act a lot like a computer and that they use something like code. Have you ever coded anything? In technology, code is used to make things like video games and websites and applications on a phone. And it seems that God gave fungi more of this automated computer processing that can receive information such as, hey, there's a source of food a few inches to the right. And then it can react to that information by changing the direction and growing toward that food source. So think about a computer. If you see a computer, you know there was a computer maker Someone very smart who put together all the computer pieces and programming. I'm very familiar with this because my dad is a computer scientist and my mom worked for many years designing websites and applications and she taught me how to use code when I was in middle school. When we see something like a computer or a smartphone, we know that someone designed it. Likewise, When we see something as complex as slime mold, we know it has a designer. When we look at things in nature that are so detailed and incredible and wonderful, such as fungus that can navigate and solve puzzles, we see that these things reflect our creator who makes the very best designs. Psalm 104, 24 says, How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom, you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Did you guys hear that? In wisdom, God made all of these things. And in all of these things, we can see his wisdom and his intelligence. When this psalm was written, there were no microscopes. There was no way to see such a tiny thing like so many fungi. It's only recently, with new scientific discoveries and technologies, that we're learning all about the world of fungi and all the amazing things in the fungi box. More and more, we are discovering just how many God's works are and the wisdom behind them all. Do you remember our trivia question? What is the largest living thing on earth? Do you have any ideas? The largest living thing on earth that we know about is a fungus in Oregon. Specifically, it's a honey fungus. If you go and walk where it is, you might just see the mushrooms popping up from the forest floor. But remember, those mushrooms are part of something bigger. And in this case, much bigger. It's about the size of 1,665 football fields. That's a very big fungus. Here's a challenge for this week. Go find a mushroom. They often grow in the forest around or on logs and trees, and they especially show up after rainfall because they need water to grow. Try to draw or write about the mushroom that you see, but remember, don't touch it. As you observe a mushroom, remember that it is just a small, piece of fruit representing something much bigger and that God is actively at work in many ways in creation and in our lives and that he will produce good fruit in our lives. Hey listeners, did you know I have a new book? It's called Rooted in Wonder, Nurturing Your Family's Faith Through God's Creation. I wrote it for your parent or caregiver to inspire and equip them in taking you outside and connecting with God in creation. 
Rooted in Wonder is full of fun activities you can do as a family to explore God's wild and wonderful world. Pick up a copy on Amazon, my website, erinlinum.com, or wherever you purchase books.